Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. So welcome to the premiere episode for the Blue Security Podcast. I'm your co-host, Andy Jaw, and I'm a security analyst for a healthcare company. My co-host, Adam Brewer, I'll let him introduce himself real quick. Hey, Andy. Adam Brewer. I'm a senior technical specialist covering information security for a very large software company. This podcast is really designed for security defenders. We're going to talk about different technologies that will help protect your company. One of the things that we did talk about earlier, Adam, that I want to do kind of a a little deep dive on. In the news recently from Microsoft, it was released that there are some malicious actors uh, from Russia, China, and Iran that are targeting our election. Did you see this this news? Yes, I did. Obviously, it's it's really timely and uh, very concerning. But I wanted to kind of, instead of going into, you know, specifically on the news um, exactly, I wanted to kind of take an offshoot on one of the security practices that a lot of people do, which is geo-restricting IP addresses from different countries and organizations. One of the configurations that a lot of people do when they get in there under their networks is if there's an IP address that's coming from certain countries or certain regions, They just go ahead and block that. And I saw someone on Twitter just recently about this kind of push back against this practice, which was, if you're doing this, it's essentially racist. And it's not good for security because, you know, in our, in this day and age, you can just circumvent that by using a VPN to, you know, exit and egress out of a different um, country. What do you what do you think about that, Adam? Yeah, I I kind of agree with the the criticism there. Not necessarily. I I don't think it's coming from at least an intentionally racist mindset, but perhaps unconscious bias for sure. But from the perspective of security, I think it's concerning whenever you're writing static rules, because static rules can be discovered relatively easily and then worked around. And any attacker worth his or her salt is probably not going to present themselves as from the location they're actually coming from. Of course, that's kind of hacking 101 is cover your tracks and and appear to come from a different place than you actually are coming from. And so what's generally a better practice would be to implement some sort of real-time detection for anomalous logins, whether they're from an unfamiliar location or have unfamiliar sign-in properties and, and go about it that way. And it's, uh, yeah, I just, I just don't see this as really productive. However, on the other hand, and if I'm going to make the argument for it now, I would, I, I would say that there's a practice that I kind of encourage customers to do where if you don't do business in a country, why do you allow sign-ins from that country? Just reducing your overall attack surface, I think, is a good practice. You sh- certainly shouldn't leave open more than you need to. And so I think there's an argument to be made there, but that's more from a perspective of instead of creating a block list, creating an allow list. We're only going to allow sign-ins from these countries. And that's probably a good practice at least to consider. It depends on the complexity of your organization and your attitude towards vacation and everything else. And and of course, how global of an organization you are. But that's that's totally different because it's it's coming at it from the opposite perspective. So I agree with the idea of reducing attack surface for sure, but that's not really what you're doing here. You're being very tactical and and you're you're being reactive to specific threats in a way that I think doesn't really line up with how any sophisticated threat actor would work. And especially in the case of like these election 
concerns in particular, if, if you know, I'm running security for an, a campaign, these, <laughs> these are not just script kitties here, right? These are highly advanced nation state threats. And of course, they're not appearing to come from their actual geolocation. I mean, of course, they're not. So ultimately, this is kind of feel good security, security theater, that might not actually be that beneficial. At least that's my perspective. When I think about configuration and security rules for my home network, you know, I use an enterprise grade network security. And I took the the first option where it was reactive, where I, you know, from different countries, I just went ahead and blocked that. And I think looking back on that, that is kind of the feel good security where it may not actually reduce any threat in general. But from a password manager, you know, I had previously used a product called LastPass. And in there, you do have the option, again, to geo-restrict traffic. And when I configured my LastPass, I had actually just allowed traffic from the United States. So in that case, it's kind of like the secondary situation that you mentioned where you're configuring an allowed list, where I know that if I'm in the United States, all the traffic should be within the United States and shouldn't be coming from anywhere else. And then when I did travel internationally, I would specifically pick the country that I was going to or countries and allow traffic from there. Or I would have to use a VPN from those countries back to the United States just to access my last pass. One of the things I want to mention was I remember you stating, you and I used to work together, and I remember yep. you stating a kind of, a, I'll call them atomisms, you know, <laughs> um, because, because I think everyone learns from each other in security, and certainly um, everyone has different um, opinions on things. But one of the things that I, that I found that I kind of stuck with me that you had said one time, you don't recommend you know, configuring an allow list based on IP addresses. That's a, that's a very common configuration where you would usually configure IP addresses of your company, like the egress points, the public IPs, and then say, oh, everything within these IPs, I'm not going to say MFA or I'm going to trust explicitly, you know. Um, and I remember you saying that that was not something that you recommended. Do you still kind of subscribe to that type of philosophy? Yeah, absolutely. It, and that really ties into, and I apologize for the use of the buzzword here, uh, but ties in with a zero trust mindset where just because traffic originates from your network doesn't necessarily mean you should implicitly trust it. And you can walk me through all the controls you have, physical controls, you can have MAC address based controls like Cisco ICE and stuff like that. And, and that's great, but attackers are really good at finding the way around it. And anytime you create a scenario where I, as an attacker, if I can jump through one hoop, that might be kind of challenging, but now I have free reign, that's really scary, right? We don't ever want to create a scenario where if I can get behind this blockade, now I have pretty unfettered access. And when you create rules like that to not challenge for MFA for connections originating from a network location, you're creating that scenario, which is highly attractive to attackers because I essentially have to break one set of controls and now I have open access. Really not a, a good practice at all. And obviously today, organizations have learned very much the hard way just how bad of an idea that is to hairpin all the traffic back through their corporate network and then try to egress it to massive cloud services like Office 365 a lot of things fall down when you do that. And it, it doesn't even align to best practices from companies like Microsoft. So you really have to move to a model where you're looking at every single connection, every single authentication attempt and making a decision each and every time based on the risk factors present in that sign-in, as opposed to, again, kind of going back to what I said earlier with the geolocation blocking static rule sets. Static rule sets are always enticing to attackers. All right. What I found interesting, you know, in the article about the attacks on our campaigns was that they were essentially using the same attacks that they were using previously during the 2016 election. There, and, and it's attacks that are very, very common. You know, the vector for attack by far for most cyber criminals, what they prefer is email. You know, typically they do some sort of spear phishing and they 
get users to click on these links. But one of the new things um, that has popped up, you know, spear phishing was the, the original tactic and they're still using that. But one of the new tactics that they're using is something called password spraying. So if you're not familiar with password spraying, it's essentially you can do some sort of intelligence and it's pretty easy to find out what your email address or what your logins are based on, you know, company emails that are put out there. You know, if you find a specific company, it's pretty easy to figure out, okay, it's first initial last name at, you know, company.com or first name dot last name at company.com and social networks like LinkedIn, it, you know, you can easily find out positions, email addresses, and then therefore usernames. And by doing that, you can then spray the password, very common passwords like password one, two, three, fall, you know, 2020, autumn, 2020, summer, 2020, or, you know, even like for different locations, like say Wisconsin sports teams, right? Like Packers 2020. And so you don't have to necessarily brute force these. You just try it once. And if it works great, you know, if it doesn't work, you know, you try a different password against 20 some thousand accounts or however many there are inevitably you're going to usually get one one of the things that i think is a great tool to protect against this is password protection through azure active directory and most people um, use some sort of active directory and they usually sync their identities at least up to azure ad but one of the things that you can do is also sync your passwords. And Adam, I think you have a little bit of experience with uh, password protection. Yeah. So Azure AD password protection, by the way, doesn't require you to synchronize your passwords to Azure AD. So even if you're not doing that, you can still benefit from this product. What it does is it pulls the most commonly used passwords from Azure AD, as well as a, a custom banned password list that you can create, and then prevents users from sending their passwords to passwords that contain those words or phrases. And it will even do things like character substitution. So if somebody's trying to be clever and replace an S with a dollar sign, it will pick up on that as well. So there's two pieces to it. There's a cloud component as well as an on-premises component. And it's something you can install inside of your corporate network or organization. And it will detect passwords that might have those keywords that you've chosen to ban or especially the most common ones and prevent users from setting their passwords to that. So certainly that's, that's part, you know, one tool in the toolbox for protecting against password spray attacks. What you can also do from that perspective are walk away from some of the antiquated password controls of the past. So Microsoft now publishes password guidance that no longer suggests having complexity requirements, that no longer recommends uh, history requirements, that no longer recommends um, periodic password changes. All of those have kind of been walked away from over the past several years, not only by Microsoft, but also, you know, NIST as part of the United States government, for example, as well, has some of the same recommendations. And the reason why these help you with password spray attack is because it helps dissuade users from setting weaker passwords since they have to change them more frequently, or especially since they have to be so complicated. If you focus more on a user creating a good password, that's long enough and you know not necessarily complex, but doesn't use common keywords or key phrases, now you have a password that is good and then you're not gonna make them change it because why would you make them change it? You know, if you really get down to it, the concept of periodic password expiration is kind of crazy because there's two scenarios. Either scenario number one, I don't have your password, in which case, why are you making me change it? Nobody has it. It's not compromised, so what's wrong with it? What value is there from changing it? There isn't any from a security perspective because it's not compromised. And then on the other hand, if the password is compromised, what's an acceptable length of time for an attacker to have access to a compromised password? Because I would suggest it's zero. There is no acceptable length of time. So when you said a password expiration policy of, let's say, 90 days, what you're really saying is, well, if an attacker gets it, we'll make them change it every 90 days and that'll kick them out, which first off is 
you know, not true. An attacker will use a password the moment they compromise it. And secondly, if you're banking on an event happening four times a year as your method for rooting attackers out of your environment, that's not very good security practice. And there's such significant downsides to it because it, it, it incents users to do those kind of rotational passwords, like you mentioned, spring 2020, fall 2020. And getting rid of password expiration, you can tell users, set a password once that's really good. Let's even make it a passphrase. Let's make it you know 16 characters. But I'm never going to make you change it unless we detect it's compromised. Now that's actually better real security for everyone. So password protection, for sure, it's it's a tool modern password policies help as well. And then, you know, again, going back to the drumbeat of having detection for these anomalous behaviors as well, not just at the individual user level, but having an identity provider that can detect when a password spray attack is happening, because they're also designed to get around traditional defenses of we're going to increment failed attempts per user. And you say, okay, well, I'm only going to fail an attempt once for every user, but I'm going to go hit every user. We traditionally haven't built controls to detect that. But certainly, if I see this same IP address or, or range of IP addresses keep showing up and keep failing attempts across all my users, eventually that should trip some sort of warning, right? And the good identity providers certainly do that and have detections against password spray as well. So there's a lot of different controls you take that like anything in security, it takes a village. It takes a lot of different efforts working together to protect against this. But I would certainly say my big two hit list are A, having a banned password list of, of some kind, and B, adopting modern password principles. Both significantly would reduce the risk of password spray being successful. Yeah, and I, I want to piggyback off of the second point that you made, the antiquated password policies. I think you know, I was frustrated um, this week, and I think I I messaged you um, earlier this week to kind yep. of show you a screenshot. <laughs> but um, you know, I I'm a I'm a veteran, and you know, there are some DoD systems that I still have access to that I have logins as a veteran, and you know, one of them, you know, I get this email, and it's crazy because the password policy that they want is every sixty days you have to change your password. And, you know, I I actually sent them an email saying, hey, you know, you should reconsider this policy. There are better practices nowadays. And they replied that this is the official DOD policy. And so every 60 days I have to change this. Um, So imagine me, you know, changing my password today and then 30 days uh, before it expires, which is just 30 days from now, I get an email saying that my password is going to expire in 30 days. And then they send me another email 15 days. And then once I hit the 10 day mark, they send me an email every single day until my password is changed. <laughs> um, it's just crazy. I think, um, and at my current company, we do have, you know, a, a password um, change policy. And I think it's hard to get away from that. But also, even if we wanted to, there are some antiquated compliance audits out there that are slow to change to even the NIST standard, right? Like even though NIST recommends that you don't change your passwords nowadays, there are some different compliance audits out there that, you know, as the auditors, and the the auditors are not security folks, you know, they're just going off of a checklist. Like, Mm -hmm. do you have a password expiration policy? Mm -hmm. Do you have a complex password requirement, right? They're just going down this checklist and either you say yes or no. And if you say no, they don't know any different. It's just you don't meet compliance, right? Right. Yep. That's exactly it. Is it's so interconnected, and there's all sorts of different regulations and requirements that still point to these kind of requirements. And and I recognize for a lot of organizations, especially those with complex compliance requirements, that it's just going to be hard to turn the Titanic, essentially, when we've had these password policies literally in place for 20 plus years at a lot of places. So it's yep. it's going to be hard, but this is where it starts, right? There has to start to be major security software technology companies driving this, as well as government entities driving this. And, and we have that. And so then it, it becomes time to to convince them otherwise and and even in case of Microsoft saying they they have password guidance now that is 
walks away from a lot of those policies. This is, of course, interesting that those were not part of the Windows security baselines for a while after that guidance has been published. So on one hand, Microsoft was saying, hey, you shouldn't do this anymore. But on the other hand, they were still publishing Windows security baselines that enforced password expiration. I, I think it was 62 days was the specific and I, I don't know why such a specific wow, that's, number. That's pretty short. But but it was, yeah, it wasn't aligned. And so recently within, and when I say recently, let's say in the last 12 to 18 months, the Windows security baselines now reflect that as well. And they don't mandate any particular setting. And that's a perfect example of where there was guidance being published. But if you had auditors who were measuring your your Windows environment against, say, published Microsoft security baselines, which would be a reasonable thing to do. The baseline still said, you need to expire passwords on this frequency, you need to have this much password history, and so on and so forth. So it's it's slow going. And some organizations who are less compliance encumbered will be able to make these changes sooner as well. And that's that's the other part of it as we have that that slow uptake in modern password policies, it'll eventually become challenging for organizations to not adopt them as well. So I do want to mention as well, kind of uh, from an anecdotal you know, example, that password protection in Azure AD is actually what I would consider like a quick win to really shore up protections against this sort of attack. It was something that... I deployed at my company and when you talk about passwords and and making different changes to policy there are some companies that can be a little apprehensive on what's the impact to the users right from an any type of IT you know change there's always that fear that this is going to cripple the environment or you know pe- users aren't going to get to log in anymore and and all of that especially right now too more than ever right it, Exactly, right? Like you you just don't want to hinder them in any way. But from a password protection, uh, this this particular feature, you know, you can deploy it without, you know, making any impact to the users. It's really, I think one of the key things to remember is that the password protection actually only works upon resetting or, you know, setting your password, right? It doesn't trigger if I have an existing password that doesn't you know, meet the requirement, it doesn't necessarily force me to change that. And so it's fairly low impact. And from my experience, you know, I deployed it at a real company. And you know, obviously we had a lot of talks about should we go forward with this, what the impact is going to be. And then I remember asking you, Adam, now that we have it in place, and you know, we turned on the switch, we deployed it, and you know, the company didn't come to a halt, uh, which was great. <laughs> but one of the things that I asked you, I remember, was how do I actually get people to have good passwords? Like, should we should we set um, an expiration date on everybody's password? Should we reset everybody's password? You know, have this mass communication. And I remember you had some thoughts on that. Yeah, I think. You never want to create a scenario where you have a mass rush on your help desk. That's always kind of concern one. And by the way, I spent many, many years in corporate IT before I I joined my current role in technical sales. So certainly I have experience and, and have the scar tissue of that thought process of always being concerned about a run on the help desk is is basically the worst case scenario. And I think you do want to create a scenario where once you've put this protection in place, that it's had a chance to cycle through your user base. And and I suppose it depends on what your current password expiration policy is, but I bet it's quarterly or stronger. That's probably good enough, right? Where you can just kind of cycle through user passwords as they come up for expiration. And then you know, hey, within three months, We're not going to have any of these common passwords or any of these common keywords in any of our user passwords anymore. And that's probably pretty good from a security perspective. That's about as good as it gets. And especially when you can do that with zero additional impact above and beyond typical password reset cycle that's already established in your organization and everyone is accustomed to, that's 
almost to zero impact change, right? Because it's nothing changed. The user's password comes up for renewal and they have to change their password. The one challenge, I'd be curious to hear if you ran into this in real world practice, is that because some of the Windows password change messages are hard coded, they can't specifically tell a user that their password was unacceptable because it contained a banned keyword, for example. So Wisconsin, let's say somebody's trying to set Badgers 2020 exclamation mark. And they're like, what? I don't get it. It's got a capital B. It's got lowercase letters. It's got numbers. It's got a symbol. Why is that not okay? And and honestly, the error message is not going to be terribly helpful. So did you run into this in your world? Did this Was this something that, that was a challenge? Did you do user communication ahead of time? Because that's the one challenge I see with this is, is dealing with those hard-coded messages that don't really effectively coach users as to what's wrong and what they need to fix. Yeah, so that is a very good point, and we did run into that. So we didn't put out any communication for this. We just flipped the switch. We did let our help desk tier one, tier two folks know that we were doing this. We wrote a KB article detailing what the uh, the new requirements are. And we even published for our help desk all of the banned passwords that we put in there for custom words. Obviously, we'll update it if any new words come up. But we published that for them so that they knew, hey, you know, you can't use this word and any iteration of it, right, with it. And for us, I wouldn't consider it a, a lo- very, very large organization. We're not like 50,000, 100,000 people. So we're not getting thousands of, of passwords getting reset a day. You know, at most, we're getting maybe, you know, less than 100 for sure a day. And, and you're absolutely correct. And the message from the traditional window side does not really give you the the messaging that hey this password doesn't really meet the requirements from a this banned password list right now if you are changing it through Azure AD like in the self service password reset or in a Azure AD joined or hybrid Azure AD joined device and you're resetting it from the the Windows screen there is a message there that does say, hey, this doesn't meet the complexity requirements. Please contact your IT administrator. But yeah, we had people call in on the help desk and then those folks would, would ping us and I would refer them back to the, the knowledge article that I wrote. And usually that resolved it. We didn't get a high influx of, you know, just users getting frustrated that they couldn't set it. But for the most part, most people either set a password and it worked or they set one and take them a couple of tries and, and then they'd be good. So it was overall, it's been, I think it's been one of the best things that we've done. And, you know, I can tell you at my company, we do uh, like an annual pen test, you know, to as a compliance requirement. And, you know, every year up until this year, they've always gotten a set of credentials through a password spray attack or something like that. They've always gotten a at least a, f- a handful, if not more, mm-hmm. credentials right off the bat, right? Mm-hmm. This was the first year, and, and it's been more than six months. So, you know, our password expiration was six months. So I followed your advice in the fact that after six months of this, we know that everyone's been cycled through, right? Mm-hmm. With the exception of, obviously, every company has this. There are some users who have that little checkbox that says never have to change the password. And we're still working through that. But from the ones who, who are, they've all been cycled through by now and, and have hit this password policy. And this was the first year through our pen test where they did not get a single credential um, ah, through a password spray attack. That's awesome. So that's that's some real world success right there. I like it. It is. It is. So, yeah, I think, you know, this is a great technology that can certainly help against and it's, it's a quick win. It's it's really easy. And you mentioned it, you know. And I think what I'll do is I'll post the documentation for Azure AD password protection in the show notes. So mm-hmm. if anyone wants to go and, and look at the documentation, it's pretty easy to follow. If you're doing it on-prem, it's an agent that you install um, onto your domain controllers. Turn on the feature in Azure AD. Configure your custom list if you want. But otherwise, you know, most of the dark web compromised passwords that we all know about, right? Like monkey 
password, you know, those are all going to be automatically blocked through the password protection. So, yeah, and and should also mention because this always comes up from a, a licensing perspective, it's worth noting that anyone, regardless of licensing, you can be totally free Azure AD. You can use this with the built-in protection with the most common use passwords, and you don't need to own anything. You don't need to give Microsoft any money to do that. If you want to do the custom band password list, which is obviously a really good idea to, you know, here in Iowa, ban those Hawkeyes, Cyclones, Bulldogs, Panthers type passwords, and you know the similar ones in Wisconsin or, or wherever you're from, uh, that that does require the the first tier of premium. But just to get the blocking from the most common passwords, that is completely free. And so there's really no reason to not at least stand that up in your organization. Again, Andy mentioned quick win. And, and certainly with all the password guidance today, one of the best things you could you can do to protect against password spray attacks. Thanks for that, Adam. I think that should be, I think, our show for this time. Any closing remarks, Adam? <laughs> well, this is fun. I, I love geeking out over this stuff and, and look forward to everybody joining us again next week. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have another show uh, recorded for next week. We'll go over some more ways that you can defend your enterprise. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.